so you heard from Joe uh, this week about two things, two concepts, structure and direction. So uh, my state of the nation is very simple. Structure, handbasket, direction. Canada is in the handbasket. That's my state of the nation. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> oh, no, just joking. All right. No, that's just a joke. Bad joke. It's a joke. Okay. So I, I want to start with foundations uh, because it's so, so, so important that we get this right. When Christians get this right, bad things can happen. You remember we talked about how to Tommy Douglas, a uh, well-meaning Baptist uh, guy who brought us um, Medicare or uh, nationalized health in Canada, uh, for, the, for the good that that's been, there's also been problems. We talked about how um, the, the guy that started our universal education here in, in Ontario, um, Ryerson, thank you, also a Christian. But if you don't have your foundations right, you can lead to bad, bad effects. So quick, quick review. I'll do this really fast. Uh, buckle up. It's going to... It's gonna... Um, so uh, when we ask who is sovereign, who has authority in a particular situation over particular people in a particular time, uh, the answer is, well, it depends. It depends who's been given or delegated sovereignty from God. The big three is the state. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, uh, Psalm 72, Isaiah 1. The state's been given the sword to punish the bad, protect the good, particularly human life human property and uh, liberty or freedom to do as we ought to do. Those are the big ones. Uh, the church, of course, has been given keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's the preaching of the gospel, church discipline. They're in charge of the sacraments. Uh, they're also uh, been given the calling to minister, uh, administer mercy, the ministry of mercy, right? That's the church. So if the um, state has been given the sword and the church has been given keys, then the family has been given a rod and that rod is for educating and uh, shaping the moral uh, character of children. Deuteronomy 6, Ephesians 6, Book of Proverbs, the whole thing is, is about that. Uh, fathers or parents raising their children in the fear of the Lord. That's the, that's the basics of sphere uh, sovereignty taught by this guy, uh, Abram Kuyper, my man. And uh, the key to Kuyperian sphere sovereignty is this, that Jesus Christ reigns as king over them all, all of the spheres over the family, over the church, over the state. They are not their own autonomous uh, authority structure. Rather, they are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. This is where Kuiper's very famous statement, there is not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's all his. That's worth memorizing, by the way. And C.S. Lewis, actually, about 70 years later, says something very similar. He says, there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Every square inch, every bit of geography, and every split second, every moment of time is claimed by God. He is ruler over it all. Now, there's other people who also have a sense of sphere sovereignty, like Mrs. Claus. Um, that's not actually Mrs. Claus. That's the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice McLaughlin. She was the longest serving uh, justice in the history of the, the Canadian Supreme Court also the longest serving chief justice of the uh, Canadian Supreme Court. Uh, she's definitely left her mark on law in Canada. She also has a view of sphere sovereignty. For example, she recognizes that there, there is a sense that the family is the one in charge of raising and disciplining children. In a, in a court case in 2004, she ruled that, yes, the family can discipline children. Now, of course, she imposed her own limits on that. She said the child may not be disciplined corporally, if they're under two or over 12 and never with this, an object and always with an open hand, never on the head and so on and so forth. But at least reckon occur from time to time within the family. And she also recognizes the, uh, the autonomy of the church to a certain degree. She ruled just in 2018 with a unanimous court that when it comes to church discipline, disciplining and expelling a member who was unrepentantly drunk and verbally abusing his wife, that the courts were not competent, their words, were not competent to delve into questions of church membership. Okay, So there's this recognition of the, of the sphere of the church. But look where she places the sphere of the state. Okay? Uh, and remember, of course, the courts are part of the state. Sometimes judges think that they're uh, apart, like as in separate from the state, but they are a mechanism of the, of the civil government. They're one of three uh, parts of the, of the civil government. How do I know she thinks 
Well, because in a speech she gave in 2002 at McGill University uh, School of Law, she said this, the authority claimed by state-written law touches upon all aspects of human life and citizenship and live, leaves little of human uh, experience unaffected by its claim to authority. You could say this another way. You could say it this way, that there's not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which the state, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. That's a problem. That's a problem because we recognize, of course, the lordship of Jesus Christ over every sphere. He is the measure of all things. Okay, so this is a bit more detailed, of course, with our spheres, right? The big three, again, family, church, state. Also important is self-government. Self-government right there in the center. So family government, church government, civil government, self-government. We also recognize, and this is where philosophers can, can uh, get carried away, perhaps, but anyway, charities and the arts and the academy and civil labor associations, the media and marketplace. Those are also spheres, but, but not quite as important as the big three of family, church, state, as well as self-government. Christ is Lord of them all anyway. Now, there are four wrong views of sphere sovereignty, and I'll go through this really quickly, but it's important to, for us to get it right and be aware of getting it wrong. Sphere sovereignty and two kingdoms uh, view takes Christ out from being Lord over all of the spheres. Uh, they put him on one side of the sphere. So the Lord of the church, Lord of your family, if it's Christian one, Lord of Christian charities, Lord of yourself if you're a Christian, into the arts or the academy or the civil government or the marketplace, uh, you know, different standard over there. I'm being very simplistic, but um, that's basically what it boils down to. Another wrong view is, is the view of domination, that the church as institute will govern all spheres. Uh, it doesn't, that's also not quite the right view. This would have been the view probably of the Roman Catholic Church leading into the Reformation. It's the Roman Catholic Church that's using the sword of the state to exercise church discipline by you know, arresting and burning at the stake you know, so-called heretics, right? That's a, that's a problem. Also, the view of isolation. Isolation of the radical Anabaptists is not, not a proper response either. They take Christ, put him in the church, and then remove themselves from the marketplace, the media, the arts, uh, the academy, and the civil government. They just, just say, well, the, the place for the Christian is just to isolate ourselves in the family, the self, maybe some charities, and the church. That's also the wrong view. And then this view is probably the dominant view in the church today in response to COVID-19. That is, yes, Christ is Lord, but under Christ is the civil government, and under the civil government is maybe church government, family government, and self-government. Also a problem. Each government is under Christ as their ultimate Lord. Quick, uh, so those are the four wrong views, okay? Philosophy, a little bit of philosophy. Am I going a little bit too slow? Should I pick it up or... Okay, that's good. All right, so this guy right here, I think, has had a profound impact on Canadian public policy and on uh, Canadian political philosophy. His name is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a philosopher in France uh, leading up to the French Revolution. He actually died before the French Revolution, but his ideas fueled, fueled the French Revolution. And two of the big ideas that he had that I think is infecting our political discourse today is the uh, view of radical autonomy, that each person should be free to do whatever they want to do. He's the one who came up with that, you know, man is born free and everywhere is in chains. So that side of things, and also the ultimate authority of the elected state, the representative state. So very high view of the state, very high view of the individual. Responding to the ideas of Rousseau uh, and the French Revolution is this guy, Grun van Prinsterer. Uh, he's writing about 100 years after uh, Rousseau, and they're both wrestling with the same questions. Who is ultimately sovereign? Who is going to be sovereign? Is it the state, the civil government? Is it the autonomous individual? Rousseau said yes to both of those. Brune says it's God. It can only be God. And when we get the answer to that question wrong, bad things happen. Okay? Ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims, and we see this with uh, the bloody philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The Kumar Rouge and Pol Pot in Cambodia. Pol Pot went to France, studied the ideas of Rousseau, thought they were so great, went to Cambodia and forced them on Cambodians and killed 1.5 million Cambodians in just four years, uh, taking his ideas a little too literally. Okay. 
very bad ideas have, have victims, right? And so this is what, what happens with a Rousseauian view of state and individual. We, you know, we recognize, yeah, church family, but they become less and less important. They shrink in importance and they shrink in their authority, right? Rousseau says, oh, those are just chains. Those are chains on the individual. And they shrink and shrink, less and less importance, less and less authority, less and less recognition until you just get this, the civil government with chickenpox. Um, Rather, the civil government with a whole lot of just autonomous little individuals floating around on their own with no mediating institutions uh, left for them uh, at all. No institutions with their own authority also given by God. Not the family to guard uh, children. Not the church to shepherd uh, the faithful and to minister to uh, those outside of the church. Not um, associations, free associations for the arts or for the academy and so on. It's just the state and the individual. And that's, uh, again, contrary to, the, to God's design for, for authority and for, um, for creation. All right, so that's our foundation. All right, I'm going to switch over now. So that's using Prezi. I'm going to now switch to PowerPoint because I believe in diversity, tolerance, and inclusion. Okay, so um, I should also note I'm really sorry that that I'm dressed like a slob this, this afternoon. Mike Thiessen said to me yesterday, Andre, you have to dress down when you give your presentation on Friday because you know, you're just way too overdressed. So here I am, no tie, no vest, no jacket, no bling. I hope you're satisfied, Mike Thiessen. I hope you're satisfied. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so into then the uh, state of the nation, state of the nation. With the state comes coercion. Remember that. Is that a bad thing? With the state comes coercion. Is that a bad thing? Yes? No. I say, depends. When the state does its job, you want the state to be coercive. When the state is bearing the sword to keep my neighbor from stealing from me, or my neighbor from raping my wife, or my neighbor from killing me, or uh, my neighbor from enslaving me, I want the state to be coercive. God gave it the sword to be coercive. To, to, to put down the violence and the greed of mankind. I want the state to be coercive when it's doing its job. But when the state starts to do other people's jobs, the job of the family, the job of the church, the job of other institutions, then it's a really, really big problem. And we're going to see that in the coming uh, 45 minutes or so. So the, the opening words, or not the opening words, the chorus, sorry, of our national anthem is a prayer. God keep our land glorious and free. God keep our land glorious and free. That word free is pretty important. Uh, when we're praying that, when we're praying that, 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 that has to mean something more than just, you know, we, we sing it or, or we pray it and then that's it. Rather, God calls us to both pray and work. So if we're going to pray, God keep our land free, that also means we have an obligation, I think, as Christian citizens and as just Christians praying to our Father this prayer, that we do everything we can uh, to keep Canada free, to speak out against um, authoritarianism, tyranny, and so on. But it's also important to remember what we mean by freedom. Today, these days, if you asked an average Canadian and even some Christians, what, what does freedom mean? They think it means autonomy, the right to do what I want, when I want, how I want, and nobody can tell me anything other than that. Not what we mean by freedom. It's not autonomy. It's not Rousseau's idea of freedom that we need to be able to, to be our own gods. No, the type of freedom we mean as Christians is the type of freedom I think best articulated by Lord Acton, good Englishman. See, England produces good people, um, who comes up with, who said it this way, liberty or freedom is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. Liberty is not the power of doing what we like, but the right of being able to do what we ought. So freedom, liberty, in the Christian tradition comes with this deep sense of duty or responsibility, that there's a strong calling to, to respond to the things we ought to do. That's what we're talking about as Christians, what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm moving forward with, the, with this question or this point about, about freedom. Okay, so in Canada, of course, we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it actually starts off really, really well, right? In 1982, this was brought into our Constitution, so this is part of the highest la uh, law in our land, and its opening words are these words, majestic words. Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. It's actually a really nice preamble. I 
I really like it. I would probably use the word the sovereignty of God and the rule of law, but it's probably see we're a close second best. And uh, and the rule of law. Okay. Um, so that's good. Um, and uh, the rule of law, of course, means that we're governed not by the whims of tyrants, uh, not by uh, the whims of bureaucrats and so on, but, but we're governed by, by law. That's a Christian development. Uh, that's a, a development from Christendom. That's something that's been developed over the last 2,000 years, uh, for which we can be very, very thankful. It's also something that's been under attack in uh, Canada, I think, for, for a while now. Certainly not just around COVID. It's certainly been undermined in, in a big way in many ways. And then the second part of the second section of the charter is that we have our fundamental freedoms. Freedom of conscience and religion, of expression, of peaceful assembly, and of association. And these actually make their way into the Niagara Declaration in various ways. You can see, see them articulated in different ways in the Niagara Declaration. These are the four fundamental freedoms of every uh, Canadian vis-a-vis -vis the state. And some people asked me, actually I had an elder call me up last week, said, I'm not sure we can sign on to the Niagara Declaration because it says freedom of, of conscience in there. And, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a church discipline case. This, this couple is living common law, uh, and they think they're free to do that. Their conscience is free. I'm like, no, 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 that's not what we mean by freedom of conscience. Vis-a-vis -vis the state, the civil government can't compel us to act in a way contrary to our conscience. They can't make us do something that we believe is sin. That's what we mean by freedom of conscience, okay? So those are our fundamental freedoms, and, and again, we're gonna look into see how those are being undermined, okay? So here's the, the state of the nation part of the state of the nation address about 20 minutes into it. I'm gonna evaluate where we're at by looking again at these three spheres. I'm gonna look at the state. Is the state doing its job? And then I'm gonna look at the church. How is the, church, uh, how is the state interfering with the church, good or bad? And then we're gonna look at the family. How is the state interfering with the family, good or bad, okay? So, step one, how is the state doing with its own job? What's the job of the civil government? Job of the civil government, from a biblical perspective, it's, it's basic job. I mean, we can argue about the periphery, but the core of the job of the civil government is to protect human life, to equally protect all human life uh, as much as it's able to do so. Um, also to protect human property uh, or property and, and uh, liberty, but, but this is number one job. Number one task, how's it doing? Horribly, actually. So in Canada, we are the only nation in the entire world, the only nation in the entire world that has no legal limits on abortion. We can end the life of a preborn child at any point during a pregnancy for any reason or for no reason at all. If you are nine and a half weeks pregnant, one day away from giving birth, and you decide, you know what, I'm just, I am just, don't feel like going through with this, you can have an abortion. There's no legal restriction on getting that abortion. In fact, uh, in Montreal a couple of years ago, a newspaper article about this uh, where a woman was seeking an abortion at 32 weeks, okay, so baby's definitely viable, the ba baby could have been delivered and lived no problem outside of the womb. She couldn't get an abortion because the medical ethicist at the hospital she went to said, no, we're not doing an abortion. This is a viable baby, you know, we're not going to do it. She went to a second one, that hospital said the same thing, no, we're just not comfortable doing this. She went to the press. The press railed about it in the newspapers. She went to a third hospital. That hospital did it at 36 weeks old. And what was the response of our parliament? What was the response of our parliament? A Bloc Québécois MP stood up in the House of Commons and condemned not the third hospital killing a child, condemned the first two for not doing the abortion earlier. And the response from parliament was that the Liberals, the NDP, and the Bloc leapt to their feet and clapped and cheered this nation for two and a half minutes straight. Cheered and clapped and clapped and cheered that we can kill a little baby at 36 weeks. That's downright shameful. It should outrage us. That's where we're at when it comes to protecting human life. That's at the front end. What about at the back end? Well, in Canada, when it comes to protecting the lives of people with extreme disabilities, people at, with advanced age, people with uh, terrible diseases, how are we doing? Well, we're doing horribly there as well. The law in Canada was changed four years ago where assisted suicide was legalized. It was legalized for people at the end of life. Okay, that's why it's called medical aid in dying, which is a horrible euphemism. But what they were trying to say was, if you're dying, if you're in your final moments, last days or weeks, 
you can have assistance from a doctor to end your life prematurely to avoid suffering. That was the premise. That was the idea behind it. As Christians, we believe that's wrong, it's immoral, but it was supposed to be pretty limited in focus. Well, some judge in Quebec last year decided that that was just unacceptable because it discriminated against people who were suffering uh, but still had 30 years left to live. They should have a right to end their life too. And so she struck down uh, the part of the law that said your death has to be reasonably foreseeable. And so Parliament is right now in the process of responding to that with Bill C-7. And the big key with Bill C-7 is this RFND, the Reasonable Foreseeability of Natural Death. Okay, So Bill C-7 tries to honor this lower court judge's ruling about the RF RFND by saying that's unconstitutional, so we're going to strike it down. RFND and no RFND. Okay, so this is so, so there's a few things wrong with this. So first of all, I don't think, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think that the federal government has ever capitulated to a lower court judge's opinion on legislation that they themselves just passed in the previous parliament like this. They always appeal it, always appeal it. What's one little lower court judge, like, you sure you got the, that person has, has it nailed? No, I don't think that judge had it nailed. They got it wrong, frankly. But anyway, okay, so, so, what did, so what does Parliament do with Bill C-7? Okay, so instead of challenging the judge or checking with the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada, they say, okay, no problem, we're just going to write a new law. So they've created two streams for euthanasia now in Canada if this law passes. Stream one, the RN, RFND stream. So this is the reasonable foreseeability of death stream. So if your death is reasonably foreseeable, natural death is reasonably foreseeable, then you go into stream one. And we'll call that the fast track. Okay. And then if you're in the other one where you're raising, you're, the reasonable foreseeability of your natural death is not reasonably foreseeable, then you're in the slow track. Slow track, oh boy. Yeah. Okay. What do you think would be the timeline for your death? If your death is reasonably foreseeable, your natural death is reasonably foreseeable, what do you think that should be? Should it be six months, one year, two years, 10 years? What do you, what do you think? Shout, shout an idea. What do you think? If you're going to go on the fast track, how long? One year, you think? 10 days? One week? Anyone else? 28 days? OK. So you would think that uh, it'd be something low, like maybe, maybe a year, maybe three months, six months, maybe 10 days. Currently, under the current law, so there's no, no slow track, right? You're only allowed currently under the law as it exists now. Only if your death is reasonably foreseeable are you allowed to get assisted suicide. We have doctors in sworn court documents, so they're, they're not hiding this. They're, they're testifying about it willingly or in op-eds in newspapers saying they're willing under this, where, where death is, natural death is reasonably foreseeable, they're willing to do it in 10 years. Okay. There's somebody in a... In a wheelchair, your death, we think, is reasonably foreseeable. In 10 years, you're going to get it, get euthanasia. And they've been doing that, okay? 10 years. All right, uh, so what about people whose death is not reasonably foreseeable? Well, I guess it would be anyone above 10 years. Anyway, the law, C7, doesn't give any guidance as to which track you should be in. So there's some doctors saying, yeah, 10 years. There's other doctors saying, no more than 12 months, like maybe one year. Why is this so important? Well, because... If you're on the fast track, what C7 also does is when it comes to uh, witnesses, when it comes to wait times, uh, when it comes to experts, okay, you don't get any of it on the fast track. Fast track, you ask for assisted suicide, you get it the same day if you want. They might say, oh, let's wait a couple of days, let's wait a week, let's wait a month, whatever. But that's totally up to the discretion of the doctor who's killing the patient. Now, you think there might be some incentive for the doctor, because they get paid for it, to fast track it a little bit faster? Yeah, of course, there's an incentive to do that. And so this here, they see euthanasia advocates in the Liberal Party and the NDP Party and most of the Bloc Party, they see these as hurdles and obstructions to people's right to a quick and easy death. Witness, like, so, so what they've done is for the fast track, there used to be a two-witness requirement. They dropped it to one. 
There used to be a 10-day waiting period. We have evidence from Quebec alone that over the last couple of years, 300 patients have switched their opinion. They had asked for assisted suicide, and over the course of 10 days said, actually, no, I changed my mind, and they're still living. Like, you know, that 10-day that period, gone for the fast track. Experts, so in the slow track, you get access to experts. So if you have cancer and you say, I want to end my life, in the slow track, you get 90-day 90 90-day 90 wait period, and you get experts. So the experts in the 90 days has to be an oncologist if it's cancer. Or let's say you have spinal muscular atrophy. you got to see an expert in spinal muscular atrophy. Or you have to see an expert in these 90 days in palliative medicine or whatever. And those experts can actually usually offer a whole ton of help to comfort and alleviate you in your pain and your suffering. And, uh, and then a lot of people don't end up asking for assisted suicide anymore. So this is a total mess, total mess. And, um, and this is what, what ends up happening. Okay, so this guy, so right now this bill, C7, is in front of the Justice Committee, okay? So the Justice Committee is in Parliament, and they're studying this bill clause by clause, each part, okay? This guy, to his credit, so this is a Bloc Quebecois MP, he sits on the committee, and to his credit, he said, we gotta give, we gotta give guidance here. Like, we have to put it in the law. If you're gonna be on the fast track, your death has to be within 12 months of his proposal. And if it's not 12 months, then okay, you go on the slow track with a 90-day wait period, access to experts, and so on. So that got voted down. The NDP and the Liberals said, no, no, we're, we can just trust the doctors. Trust the doc trust, not the doctors, trust the euthanasia providers. Like, what could possibly go wrong? You know, just trust them. Okay, so no, no guidance whatsoever. So we know we have evidence that there's doctors willing to kill patients with 10 years left, left of life now. Okay, and they don't get the benefit of witnesses and uh, wait times and experts, okay. So that gets voted down. Well, and then the, the conservatives propose, okay, for, for this one, we're gonna, we propose adding a 10 day waiting period back in and requiring experts back in, and they all vote down, even this guy. It's like, guy, you didn't get your, 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 your one year you know, clarification here, and now you're, you're voting against wait times. So I'm just gonna play a short piece of audio from his testimony, okay? So he's, he's responding to the conservatives' proposal to add, in the fast track, to add a seven-day, it's a seven-day or a ten-day waiting period. Okay, listen, listen to what he has to say. It's a bit crazy. The principles of, that you would need, even more time, time when somebody is in agony, I think that maybe people would rather uh, die rather than having the main death because of. Yeah. People are suffering, and they would, they would rather die than get made. Like, am I the only one that thinks that's weird? Like, made ends your life, right? Like, they'd rather die than be killed. Like, what the? Anyway, that's really, really weird. Okay, and, and then keep listening, okay? Because Jean-Jacques Rousseau was going to appear, not his name, but his idea. Okay? There may be a, a, a line down All right, yeah, so <clears throat> um, the whole autonomy thing, right? Absolute, like, uh, that's the principle by which the bloc and the NDP do the same thing, and most of the liberals do the same thing. They see this through the lens of autonomy. But are they consistent? Are they consistent with that? Well, I'd say they're not, and you can check out the website we created, carenotkill.ca, which, which proves this. It's the basic apologetic on euthanasia. If you put someone to, to, to somebody, say, hey, um, if, if a depressed teenager is going to jump off a bridge, do you stop them or help them? And universally, everyone says, well, of course you stop them. Like, that's, that's a tragedy. Suicide's a tragedy. Yeah, exactly. But you don't talk about autonomy then. But if you stop a suicidal teen from jumping off a bridge, you're interfering with their autonomy, aren't you? So, so there are times when <laughs> bodily autonomy or personal autonomy is not the absolute measure of all things. And so we interfere. Um, I could spend quite a bit of time on this apologetic. I'll just leave the website with you. Do check it out. 
but it, it gets to the point of the, of the ludicrous. Another problem, of course, is in this debate, there's intentional twisting of the meaning of words. So at another point in, in these hearings, the NDP member asked a euthanasia provider, in your experience, has anyone ever requested suicide? So this is a person who had just testified that she arranges about 120 euthanasia deaths a month. That's her professional job. And she said, no, in my experience, I never have people ask me to, that they want to commit suicide. Well, it's because they've changed the meaning. She just had testified. She testified that 120 people a month go to her and she arranges their assisted suicide. But she said, well, that's not, and they just changed the lingo. Well, no, that's not suicide. That's medical aid in dying. That's something apparently totally different. Now, um, I also have to, I feel bad because yesterday or the day before, I, I cracked a joke with one of you, I can't remember who, and I said, you know, with all of these COVID lockdowns and so on, if I was a senior citizen, I would just say, you know what, uh, if, I'd, and if I didn't want to be locked down, I'd say, you know what, I, I, want, I choose made medical assistance in dying by COVID. That, that's my choice. And, and, and then they can't lock you down, right, because you chose made but by uh, COVID. Well, this morning, this morning, so I had to add this slide. This is the headline in CTV News. Facing another retirement home lockdown, 90-year-old chooses medical assistance in dying. 90-year-old Nancy Russell died last month surrounded by friends and family. They clustered around her bed, singing a song she had chosen to send her off, and a doctor helped her through a medically assisted death. The exact opposite of the lonely months of lockdown Miss Russell had suffered through in the retirement home where Russell had lived for several years. Like, we're locking these people up to protect their life, and then when they say, I'd rather die than be locked up, we say, oh, no problem, we'll help you die. We have lost our freaking minds. Like, this is crazy. Um, there's something seriously wrong with, with Canada right now. This country needs so much prayer. Okay, so that's them not, the state not doing its job to protect human life. In fact, we're executing our youngest and our oldest citizens. State, it's the state that does it, right? The doctors are funded by the state. All right. What about the duties of the church and the family? Well, particularly through uh, COVID-19, we've seen that the duty to give tender care to aged parents, the duty to tend to the sick, the duty to visit and encourage the lonely, the duty to gather corporately to worship the Holy One, the duty to come for the morning, the duty to rejoice with those who rejoice, the duty to celebrate the sacraments, the duty to love the orphan and the foster child, the duty to evangelize the neighbor, the duty to work hard to provide for others, the duty to show hospitality to strangers, the duty to assist the addict, feed the hungry, care for the infant distressed, have all been restrained or restricted or curtailed by the civil government. Now, the interesting thing is that some of them have been curtailed outright, evangelism, gathering for worship, comforting, rejoicing, and showing hospitality, but other ones have not been actually curtailed or restrained. This other list, caring for aged parents, tending the sick, visiting lonely, and so on, they're still being done. The question is by who? Not by you know, children of aged parents, not by the elders laying hands on those who are sick. It's the civil government that's doing all of that. Well, that's the Ministry of Mercy. Is it for the civil government to tend to your parents? Whose job is that? It's your job, it's my job. And we're prevented from doing so. Now, thankfully, uh, in Ontario, and, and maybe uh, Sam can help us out with this on the on a question period, but I understand that there's a new bill that's been introduced that makes family essential care workers. And I think that's a really big step in the right direction there. Because that, that definitely has to change. It's ridiculous when, when an elderly man is, is prohibited from even visiting his wife through the glass window, uh, as happened in Ottawa early on. He, he was prohib prohibited from visiting his wife through the window outdoors, uh, which is absolutely remarkable. And another story, an example of a church in Guelph, uh, during the reopening, uh, so this would have been in June, July, the church put together a reopening plan, submitted it to the local health authority, here we go, we're gonna reopen, this is our safety plan, what do you think? Public Health Authority looked at it, said, there's sacraments was listed, <laughs> with no sense of irony whatsoever, said, sacraments are completely off the table. Um, can't do the sacraments. Uh, at the time, in the city of Guelph, restaurants were open, they're serving meals, and, and the church can't do it safely. Uh, that was pretty crazy. Okay, so moving from that one then to Bill C-6. This, one, this one's a big one. Okay, Bill C-6 is a, criminal, it's a proposed criminal ban on conversion therapy. 
Okay, so before we get into the bill itself, I'm just gonna hit on a couple of things around uh, gender, gender dysphoria. So gender dysphoria is when a, a child or an adult experiences a sense of, a, a psychological sense of being the gender that their body is not. So a boy who feels like they're a boy who feels like they're a girl trapped in a boy's body, or a girl who feels like they're a boy trapped in a girl's body. Um, that's a really simple way of perhaps stating it. But but the studies show that the vast majority of children outgrow that by puberty, 80% plus. We also know from studies that when it comes to attempted suicide in the general population, it's about 4.6%. 4.6% of the general population tries to end their own life at some point in their life. Within the transgender community, it's 41%. Okay? Four out of every 10 will at some point in their life attempt to end their own life. That's tragic. That's very tragic. And, and, and our hearts as Christians need to go out to those struggling uh, in this way. But why is that happening? Of course, we're told the reason it's happening is because of all those bigoted and transphobic Christians out there who aren't just accepting and tolerant and so on. And yet the studies that show that 41% show no decrease in countries like Sweden, where there's, it's been trans-affirming in Sweden for over 30 years now, or in cities like San Francisco, which is a very trans-affirming city. Th those uh, attempted suicide rates are just as high there as they are in other, other locations. So obviously there's some presuppositions, as was talked about this morning, that are feeding uh, into those, uh, those realities. Let me tell you a story about Nadine. That's not her real name but I'm going to use that name, okay? Nadine is a six-year-old girl going to... Everything else in this story is true, though. Her name's changed. So Nadine's six-year-old girl going to public school in the city of Ottawa, the city that I live and work and worship in. And Nadine um, starts going to grade one. She's a happy, outgoing, positive girl, um, a very comfortable uh, with who she is and so on. She's going to school, and she... Um, starts coming home after a month or two troubled and distraught and sometimes in tears and frustrated and something's off. And so the parents say, what's wrong? What's wrong, Nadine? What's going on? And uh, they don't really get it out of her for a while. And then after a while, uh, Nadine uh, opens up and says, Mommy, um, am I a girl? Um, and Mom's like, uh, yeah, of course. Of course you're a girl. And, and she says, well, the teacher says that there's no such thing as girls or boys. And I'm not sure if I'm a a girl or a, or a boy. It's like, no, gr uh, baby girl, Nadine, of course you're a girl. You know, it's silly to say there's no such thing as girls or boys. You're a girl, and, and daddy's a boy, and he's real, and, and you're a girl, and you're real, and that's just the way you're made. That's, that's who you are. It's not a Christian family, by the way. Uh, so anyway, they're like, just ignore what the teacher's saying. Just go back to school. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Well, it doesn't let up, and so uh, there's, there's more of this. And so the... the family, the mom, goes to the teacher and says, look, teacher, you're causing a lot of distress for my daughter. My, my daughter's really upset. Can you please just, just tell my daughter she is, in fact, a girl? It'll go a long way. And the teacher refuses. Says, no, I can't do that. Maybe she's not a girl. It's not for me to impose that on her. So the parent's like, oh, wait a second. No, that's not cool. So he talks to the principal. Says, the principal, this is what's going on. My daughter's really upset. She's, she's getting a lot of anxiety and so on. Can you tell the teacher to tell my daughter that she's a girl? And the principal says, nope, can't do that. Uh, I'm not going to get involved. So she goes to the superintendent. And the superintendent says the same thing. I'm not going to get involved. She goes to the superintendent. So there's the Ottawa Public School Board. She goes to the superintendent of curriculum in the Ottawa School Board. Asks the same thing. Same, same answer. Nope, not going to get involved. Anyway, uh, the family has now launched a human rights complaint against the Ottawa School Board. Um, alleging or arguing that, that Nadine's been discriminated against on the basis of her sex. Uh, and that if the term sex means anything, it should mean that a child who's a female and identifies as a female should be uh, left secure in that identity. And what's going on in, in the school, of course, is, is this teaching of, with ideas like the gender unicorn, that your gender is fluid and it's changing all the time, and you might be a girl, you might be a boy, or something in between, and, and you can choose your own identity and so on. It's a very confusing uh, ideology. And the thing is, is that this is not just happening to one girl in one school in one school board in Canada. This is happening to hundreds of children in hundreds of school boards all across the country. There's one psychiatrist, uh, Barb Kay, wrote about this in a National Post article a couple of years ago. There's one school where uh, one parent who had gone to a psychiatrist with their son 
son was in grade two, same problem, unsure of who he was now and so on. The psychiatrist asked the parent, uh, which school and which class are you with? And he said, you know, this school and this class, and this is the teacher's name. And the psychiatrist said, you're the seventh family who has come to me with this problem. Right? So this is happening all across uh, education systems of, uh, in, in the entire country. And it's in that context, it's in that context where this, there's this confusion for children all across the country that we have the introduction of conversion therapy bans. Conversion therapy bans. Now, what is conversion therapy? Well, the National Post defines it this way. Conversion therapy encompasses a widely discredited range of methods that purport to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And of course, the mind goes to things like electrical shock therapy. Um, uh, the, the lecture this morning was talking about some of these old, outdated methods that aren't actually rooted in a biblical worldview. Um, and we think, yeah, sure, okay, fine. If you're gonna ban that, ban that, no problem. In fact, uh, back in January, I drafted a criminal ban to ban that. Uh, I'm like, yeah, you wanna ban that? Sure, I'll write the law for you, happy to do so. But that's, of course, not what, uh, the, like the problem then is not just that. How has conversion therapy actually been defined? Well, Dr. Christopher Wells, an activist, if there ever was one, he defines conversion therapy as any form of treatment, including individual talk therapy, behavioral or aversion therapy, group therapy, spiritual prayer, prayer is conversion therapy, uh, exorcism, medical or drug-induced treatments which attempt to actively change someone's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Spiritual prayer, talk therapy, that's conversion therapy, got to criminally ban it. So legislation currently defines it this way. They say conversion therapy means things like painful aversion therapy, right, electric shock therapy, as well as body-affirming counseling. And they leave out, intentionally, sex change treatment. We should be defining change efforts that way, that conversion therapy should include sex change treatments and aversion therapy and not include body-affirming counseling. Well, Bill C-6 gets this all wrong, okay? So Bill C-6, it prohibits uh, five things. Forced conversion therapy, causing a child uh, to, to uh, undergo conversion therapy, uh, advertising and uh, making money off of it, okay? All of that's criminal. So, so it's four things listed, but number two is two parts, okay? So there's five prohibitions. So again, depending on how you define conversion therapy, that could be just fine, no problem, or it could be really, really bad. So what does the bill do? Well, it starts with this really strange whereas statement. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because it's based on and propagate myths about sexual orientation and gender identity, including the myth, that's a religious language, the myth that a person's sexual orientation and gender identity can and ought to be changed. Now, if anyone's been following the debate around gender lately, you would have been told that your gender is fluid, and fluid means changing all the time. And yet here they're saying, well, it's a myth that your gender identity can be changed. So uh, there's an inherent contradiction built into the bill, but nobody seems to want to point that out. And then the actual definition itself is this. Conversion therapy means a practice, treatment, service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual or gender identity to cisgender, which just means your, your body and your identity as a male or female matches, that's cisgender, or to repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, and then the exemption for greater certainty, the definition does not include a person's gender transition or a person's exploration of their identity. Hmm. Okay, so that's like, uh, that is a really broad definition, okay? So, uh, and it's only one directional. So one pastor called me up, He's a smart man, and he figured it out right away. He read that definition and said, wait a second, Andre. Uh, so you're telling me that if a man comes into my office, my study as a pastor, and he sits down and he says, Pastor, I've been cheating on my wife. And I say, Johnny, stop cheating on your wife. No, smarten up. This is what the Bible says, and you better, you better smarten up. We're going we're gonna to put a plan together to get you back on the straight and narrow. Um, you know, uh, so who is this woman anyway? And the man, oh, no, actually... Pastor, I've not been cheating on my wife with a woman. I've been cheating on my wife with a man. Say, oh, okay, well, in that case, um, well, have at her, Johnny, because uh, I'm not allowed to counsel you to reduce your uh, sexual behavior, non-heterosexual attraction or behavior. So, um, yeah, I can't, really, uh, can't really say anything, Johnny. Uh, have, have a good day. That's the kind of ridiculousness that a one-sided definition of conversion therapy leads to. Not only that, I had a meeting with, with uh, an NDP member of parliament to talk about this. And, and I said, well, what about people who transition one way? Let's say they're, they're biologically female, they think they're male, they do transition, and then after a couple of years they regret it and they want to transition back. 
this is a reality I know because I've had such a person in my living room and had a very long uh, and incredible conversation with this person. Um, and there's tons of these testimonies online if you would just open your eyes to look for it. He said, no, no, that's just a myth that never happened. People who transition, they, they get it right every single time. And okay, apparently. So they're blinded by their, uh, their ideology. Of course, there's all kinds of pastoral concerns here, first of all, for the well-being of vulnerable children. As much as I appreciate um, the presentation this morning, uh, Trevor's presentation, um, and, and I love, I've never really met Trevor before this week, but I love him, uh, just listening to him. He's not my number one concern. Uh, he's my number two concern. My number one concern is all of the children who will be not able to get the help that they need. This kind of a bill destroys their life. It destroys their life. Think of the story of Nadine again. That means leaving her all alone, on her own, to fend for herself, and, and only with one ideology you know, protected in law to shepherd her. And it's a really, really twisted one, right? Ideas have consequences. Bad ideas have victims. My number two, um, my number two concern is people like Trevor and pastors and elders, of course, and that is the unhindered spread and application of the gospel. That the gospel does apply even to, or especially to, who you are uh, as a male or a female, as a boy or a girl. Uh, we need to be able to apply that. There's, of course, going to lead to confusion on important doctrines, and um, I think there's a massive impact as well on parental rights and responsibilities. Okay, so when you think about this issue, Bill C-6, and it's going to be debated by the Justice Committee next. It'll probably start on next week, Thursday. Remember Nadine, and remember her story that um, apparently there's no such thing as girls or boys, and the, and the, and the twist, um, the twisted approach that, that that has on her. It completely confused her, caused her all kinds of anxiety and harm. Instead, we, we share the gospel message that you, Nadine, are a completely unique, beautiful, special creation of God made in his image. That's the message she should be getting and every other child should be getting. And Bill C-6 would prevent that. Um, how much time do I have left? 20 minutes? Okay. Okay, keep plowing on. Okay, so this is uh, a, a, another interference of the state with the church. Okay, so this story of Pastor David Lynn. Pastor David is the man in the center there. You know he's a pastor because he's dressed just like Michael Thiessen. Um, and, uh, and, and Pastor David, he... Uh, he was preaching the gospel downtown Toronto and was arrested not by one or two uh, police officers, by seven, seven or eight, probably eight, because if it was seven, that'd be just too biblical. So it was probably eight. And, and these eight police officers arrest him. What was he preaching? Was it like a Leviticus text or like something that Paul says that might be found to be uncomfortable by some? No. Pastor Lynn was preaching John 3.16. Like you don't get a more beautiful, simple gospel message then John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, whoever, anyone who believes in him, even if you have a, um, you know, if you're homosexual or, or heterosexual, if you have a, uh, you're male or female, doesn't matter. If you believe in him, uh, you will not perish but have eternal life. Turn your life over to Jesus Christ. It was an open invitation. It was actually a, a very simple gospel message. And he gets arrested for that. Thrown in jail, spends the night in jail. And he's charged criminally with two different counts, one for causing a disturbance and one for, uh, I forget the, causing a disturbance and, and another crime. Uh, anyway, two, two crimes, okay? So that, so it's going to proceed uh, to a trial. The, the charges ended up getting dropped earlier this year. Uh, I suspect the only reason they were dropped is because there's a huge backlog in the court system right now because all the courts have shut down because of COVID. And so they're just like, oh, we've got to get rid of some of these cases, drop anything that you think might be a bit frivolous. And so this one got dropped. But the, the part of the story that's often missed, and if we had more time, I'd play a video of his arrest, which is just shocking, but is, is this man right there. So his name is, and I'm not lying, his name is Sergeant Dick. And this is Sergeant Dick. <laughs> Sergeant Henry Dick from the Toronto Police Service. And that's, that's his Twitter handle, t.gaycops. So he is the poster boy for gay police officers in the Toronto police force. He attends any event that is about uh, LGBTQ. He's the guy that's there on behalf of the Toronto Police Service. And he's the arresting officer of Pastor David Lynn. He's the one who's first on the scene. He's the one who instructs the other officers to arrest him. Um, you know, think about that. Okay, uh, and the last one on the state interfering with the church possibly is the Aga versus Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So I just said, way back at the beginning of the presentation, when I said, you know, Chief Justice McLaughlin had ruled in 2018 that the, the, the courts is not going to interfere in a church discipline case, right? You remember that? 
That was a good thing. That was good news. Well, this case is basically relitigating that 2018 case. Uh, and the reason is because the Ontario Court of Appeal, just in January of this year, released a bizarre decision where they almost basically reversed that 2018 decision. We said Ethiopian Orthodox Church has its own bylaws. Okay, so in the Reformed tradition, a lot of churches have a, a church order or something similar. Okay, so that's that kind of thing. And uh, Aga thinks that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church violated those bylaws. And so, so Aga had been kicked out of the church with four other people. It had to do with a um, controversy around the doctrine of the, uh, the Virgin Mary. Um, anyway, so they, they were kicked out. And so they went to a court and said to court, hey, court, uh, we think that the church violated its own bylaws, so can you please let us back in? And the lower court judge said, no, can't, can't interfere because the 2018 case. So he appealed it to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal said, oh, no, these bylaws, they're, they're laws. And so we, the court, have competence to, to review laws. And so we're going we're gonna to interfere. Uh, so anyway, it got appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. We're going to argue this case in two weeks from now, December 9th. So please be in prayer that the Supreme Court shows the humility they did three years ago when they ruled uh, in favor of the independence of the church. Okay, so what about the family? Well, what is the family? So here, too, the state likes to meddle. 1968, divorce was uh, increased to marriage breakdown. 1986, no-fault divorce was introduced, so it became easier to get out of the marriage than the cell phone contract. Um, 1995, a judge ruled that same-sex couples could adopt. So, you know, 80, 86, of course, tosses the idea that marriage is for life. 1995 tosses the idea that moms are... Uh, important or that dads are important, right? Because if you can say two dads can adopt a child, that means a mom is irrelevant or not really all that necessary. And if you can say two moms can adopt a child, then you're saying dads aren't all that important or relevant. Um, 2005, of course, this is natural. Like, if you say that, then, you know, this kind of happens. So 10 years later, of course, you get same-sex marriage. And then in 2012, we get the addition of gender identity and expression added to the Ontario Human Rights Code and is now in every human rights code across the country. And then in 2016 and 2017 in Ontario, we get Bill 28 and Bill 89. Now, this is one of my favorite demonstrations. So I don't like to just tell you what Bill 28 does. I want to show you what Bill 28 does. So I need some, uh, I need some uh, volunteers here. So I can bore you two for a second. Uh, you're a committed married couple, husband and wife. Okay, no issues. Okay, good. Uh, and I, I need a few more. Uh, so, so yeah, you stand, stand on this side over here. Yep, close to that. And I need another uh, five volunteers. So you just, you're married, right? So, okay, so I can't have both of you, but can I have, if you come on up, and, and if you come on up, and are you a couple as well? Okay, so just, just you, and then uh, you and you, and uh, Steve, can I borrow you as well? And just stand on this side, okay? All right, so this is what Bill, uh, Bill 28 does. Okay, Bill 28 redefines the family in Ontario. Okay, so, so on, on this, this side over here, we, of course, get... Um, this, this family, a lovely and committed husband and wife couple with their little baby. And, uh, and this is, of course, the family as, as the Christian understands it, right? A father uh, and, a, and a mother and a, and a child. Bill 28 says, ah, that's, just, that's just not good enough. We've got, we've got to do more for equality and, and diversity and diversity is our strength and all that. So, um, and so they said, we, we think that um, not only should there be a family where we have you know, two men or two women who could be a family, but why limit it to two? Let's let's do four. Let's do four. So so you can have uh, one man married to a uh, one woman and another man, another man. Actually, you don't have to be married. Um, in fact, marriage is not even part of it. You, you can just live together, or, or actually, you don't even have to live together. You you can just live apart in four different homes. And in fact, you can um, not even have any sort of relationship whatsoever. You could just be coworkers or friends or people you met at the pub or whatever. No, um, no, nothing binding you together. But let's say the four of you, one, two, three, uh, four, three guys and a girl, decide one day, let's have a child together. Um, uh, obviously, the drafters of this never passed grade 10 biology and, and, um, and said, let's, let's write up a, an agreement. And it's called a preconception parentage agreement. Preconception parentage agreement. That's what Bill 28 outlines. And the preconception parentage agreement gives up to four adults the right to bind themselves together as a, as a type of family and to uh, have a family together. Now, the preconception parentage agreement means, of course, conception. We're talking about another 
child, right? So, so the preconception parentage agreement would be for up to four adults to form a family with this child. And the fifth person, so in case you're wondering why you're the fifth person, says that, oh, and by the way, the surrogate, if you want a surrogate, can also be part of the family. And this thing over here, we're going to call a family. Now, um, in order to get the moral question or the moral message to you, the people, the good residents of Ontario, we're going to call this act, anyone want to guess? All Families Are Equal Act. That's what Bill 28 is called, the All Families Are Equal Act. So it's a moral statement saying this family over here, husband, wife, biological child, where the child is going to be known and loved by their dad and their mom, and that child is going to be growing up in a stable home, and mom and dad are going to love each other and put their needs first, the needs of the other first, and they're going to care for this child, and they're going to live in the same home as the child, and that child is going to be, be stable and do well. This child has no clue who they're going to live with. They have no clue who their dad or their mom is. There's no need to tell that child who the biological dad is or the biological mom is. There's no need for those four people to live in the same building together. They could be all over the place, and that child is supposed to do just as well. And also, the moral of the lesson of the name of that act, that all families are equal, is that if that child doesn't turn out as well as that child, then the problem is not this arrangement over here. The problem is all of you, you bigots, you. Now, who here thinks that this child will do just as well as this child, all things being equal. Anyone who thinks that this child will, all things being equal, do much better than that child? Yeah, of course, right? And that's our concern as Christians. It's not, you know, what kind of arrangement a bunch of consenting adults put themselves up to. It's the kids. It's always the kids that get hurt in these kinds of things every time. Bill 28 needs to be thrown in the trash heap. Um, Anyway, you can return your children to the States. I'll take those. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and the last one, of course, uh, so much more to say. Okay, last one is conscience rights, so on self-government. Okay, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal just last year ruled that it was completely reasonable for the medical professional body to compel doctors to give effective referrals for abortion and euthanasia, even though not one single piece of evidence could be brought forward of any patient in the entire province ever not getting a euthanasia death or an abortion because of uh, doctors who had conscientious objections, which is absolutely remarkable. Think again, then, of the expansion of MAID in this country. If we're going to say that somebody who's 30 years old and is a quadriplegic but becomes suicidal says, I want to end my life. i got 30 years left to live, but I'm done. I'm out. And the doctor's like, I think that person just needs some good counseling, some support network, and so on. I'm not going to refer to them. What happens if, if, if the law is that, no, you as a doctor, you got to provide the maid. Like you got to arrange it. And if you're not going to kill the patient, you got to give them an effective referral. An effective referral is basically a prescription. you got to write the death warrant and hand it off to the doctor who will do it. Okay, it's a massive violation of the conscientious rights of physicians in this, in this province. It's a really, really big problem. We need to be in prayer uh, about that as well. I'm going to close with a couple of thoughts. Persecution, first of all. Big question mark, persecution. Are we being persecuted in Canada? Does it matter if we use that, that label? To me, it does seem, though, that the types of things we're seeing in Canada, if we just increase the scale of them, we would have no problem saying that, yes, we are facing persecution. Um, you know, when a pastor gets arrested on the streets for preaching John 3.16, it happens once and we're like, ah, is it really persecution? But if that was happening all the time, we'd say, yeah, definitely, this is persecution. But whether or not you want to apply that label to Canada, I love this quote from Theodore Beza, who once said to his king, sire, it is in truth the lot of the church in whose name I am speaking to endure blows and not to strike them but also may it please you to remember that the church is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. It is for the church to endure blows, not to strike them, but remember that it is an anvil that has, in, that has worn out many hammers. And isn't that true? It's true because uh, Christ said on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome her. And I love the passage from Revelation 1. I forgot my Bible. Revelation 1. Can't borrow your Bible. Revelation 1 is my new favorite passage ever since COVID. 
uh, started. Revelation 1, um, verse, I think it starts already at verse 9. That's an incredible uh, passage, right? So, so uh, John is standing on the island of Patmos, and, and he hears, uh, he says, I was in the, in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I hear behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, right? So you can imagine he's, he's standing on the island, and he hears this noise behind him, really loud. It's a voice, and it's like a trumpet, and it says, write what you see in a book and send it to seven churches, right? So he's like, soup and hearts, like pounding, thump, 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 thump. what is that noise? And so it says, and then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and he turns and he sees the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory, standing among seven golden lampstands. He's like the son of man, clothed with his robe, golden sash around his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool. Uh, his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet like burnished bronze. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. I don't know if any of you have been to Niagara Falls, but that's a loud noise. And he's speaking. And what's his uh, response? He falls on his face as though dead because John is absolutely, totally, completely terrified of the Lord of the heavens and the earth. So he falls on his feet as though dead. But what's Jesus' response? It's, he bends down and he puts his hand on him. He says, he laid his right hand on me and he says, fear not, fear not. So it's a gesture, right? God puts his hand on us, fear not. But it's also a command. Fear not, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus Christ has the key of death and Hades. So that doesn't, you know, it's not doctors that do. They shouldn't be trying to uh, pretend that they're gods that, that, that can save us or not from death. Christ is, and he's the one who conquered death by raising from it. And he's the one who is building his church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And so I want to end with that positive note. The king is the king and he's reigning and we get to be his, his subjects and just keep working for the advancement of his kingdom in this Canada, let's pray that God keep their land glorious and free. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andre. That was great. We have about 15 minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, yes, we do. The whole thing, no problem. <laughs> Andre, not to reduce uh, the pastoral ministry back to the pulpit because there's all of these just personal counseling situations, but mm -hmm. under the conversion therapy bill, mm -hmm. I would assume that then also technically attending a worship service uh, in which the pastor counseled the entire church to uh, avoid sexual immorality, listing any of the things that are in that bill yeah. would fall under uh, that broad definition. Would uh, would that be a correct leap? Um, uh, would it would you be a foul of the criminal code if you were just in attendance? Probably not. But um, um, you have to you have to remember that uh, anyone who participated in the planning, execution, or covering up of of any aspect of conversion therapy would be found guilty. So if you're a party to the offense, so let's say, let's say your church uh, hires Tre Trevor, was it? Yeah, Trevor was presenting earlier today, right? Uh, let's say he's on, you, you hire him for a particular case, like somebody's struggling with some issues. You say, okay, let's hire this guy to minister to, to that person. And uh, then and if your board of elders signed off on that or was aware of it um, or was made aware of it later but didn't report it to the police, any of those things would count as criminal activity contrary to that bill. Yeah. Um, unclear, and and so that's why we're pushing we're pushing for clarity in the law. So the Justice Department has said no 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 that, that would be okay. So we said good, put it in the bill. We said no, we're not going to put it in the bill. That tells me something. Why won't they put it in the bill? Why won't they put the clarity in the bill that says, for greater clarity, right? There's already two said for greater, greater clarity doesn't include a gender transition and greater clarity doesn't include somebody exploring their identity. Let's just add a couple more. For greater clarity, it does not include conversations between parents and children. And for greater clarity, it does not include, you know, any, any good faith discussion, spiritual, moral, scientific, or otherwise, including, you know, the teaching of the faith. Easy. 
pieces, just put it in there. But they won't, they're refusing to put it in. That, te that tells me something, that's what makes me so nervous. Now they keep saying, well the reason we don't need to put it in there is because it says specifically it's a practice, service, or treatment. And a sermon is not a practice, service, or treatment. But service is not defined, what do you mean by service? Are, are you paid to preach your sermon? Yeah, so are you providing a service to the people in the audience? Arguably. I don't know, it's a big question mark for me. And I want clarity in the law. And at the end of the day, if you're sitting in front of a, you know, if it's a cop who's arrested you or a crown prosecutor is proceeding with criminal pr prosecution against you or your judge, you don't care what the Justice Department said on their website 20 years ago or five years ago. You want to know what the law says in front of you. And if it's open to you to interpret that, I'd be like, hmm, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I want to know before I start preaching my sermon. or, You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you, brother. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. That's a lot of information. Yeah, sorry. But it was good. Um, we've been talking a bit this week about the church's relation to the state and with the obvious of what's going on. Um, besides forbidding clear criminal activity of the church and understanding sphere sovereignty, what things is the state, is the government permitted to forbid the church from doing? Mm. Good. Um, especially in terms of potential lockdowns and things like that. Right. Okay. So that, 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 that's a good question. And a fair question, because uh, I'm focusing on the negatives of the state, and there's positives of the state. Paul is right in saying, give thanks uh, also for the civil government. I think he says that in the prayers of thanksgiving in 1 Timothy 2, I think. Uh, I could be wrong about the text, but um, because the civil government is, in a broken and fallen world, is a blessing um, if, if it remains within its sphere. Um, it's a blessing for order, and, and so on. The Belgian Confession, Article 36, talks about that as it's good for us. So when it comes to the civil, uh, civil government and, and the church, the church has done grave harm in not recognizing the role of the civil government when it comes time to, for example, prosecute sexual crimes happening within the church circles. So um, in fact, I think it's also in uh, not just the Roman Catholic Church, but also uh, Protestant churches where for too long, uh, where sexual assault has happened, that we try to deal with it internally, keep it hush-hush, don't want to... You know, don't want people to speak ill of the church, so we're just going to hide this or cover it up or what have you. That, that's a grave error. One, it's not respecting the proper role of the civil government to uh, prosecute uh, crime and, and egregious crime at that. And, um, and then I, as well, it just causes great division and harm and hurt and, and not proper reconciliation for the people who are, have been hurt by the crime. Um, now, some people say, do you have to report every crime to the civil government? I'd say, well, no. Um, if it's two adults, for example, and, and, and they're, um, uh, let, let, let's say, for example, I mean, this would never happen with this group of people, but let's say somebody gets in an argument about, I don't know, climate change on the church parking lot, and like, it comes to blows, right? Some, one person just loses it, boom, right in the nose. Okay, so that's criminal assault, right? So do you have to call the police? Oh, well, gotta respect the sphere, sphere of the civil government, just call 911, yep. Brother so-and-so just punched uh, brother so-and-so in the nose. No, because there's a principle in, in 1 Corinthians 6, I think, that where, where Paul says, try to sort it out amongst yourself. Now, if you can't, sure, call the civil government. But you should be able to just sort it out as brothers, you know, a, a relatively minor uh, criminal act of assault um, could probably be sorted out amongst the church. But things like involving the, the abuse or harm of children in particular, uh, any sort of sexual assault, anything of a, of a grave criminal nature should be... Um, Put to the to the state. One other example I'll give in the age of COVID. So a lot of people have used this example. What about fire codes? Right, civil government can set up fire codes, building codes for buildings. Is that a proper role of the, of the civil government? I think yeah, probably as long as it's um, as long as it's consistently enforced. So if the local fire uh, official shows up and says, okay, this church here, you can seat 40, but then approves the bingo hall down the street, same size for 400 people, well then. You know that's illegitimate, and I think the, the civil government can be either ignored or challenged on that on that point. Um, but I would also add, and this is sometimes missing. I think sometimes Christians have a, a much lower view of the competence of the church than they should, because look in history. What are the longest, oldest, oldest lasting buildings in the, in all of Europe? The oldest buildings in all of Europe are castles and churches. So, like like the Notre Dame in, in Paris, the only reason it fell down 800 years old, the back end of it fell down, is because it burnt down 
And even though it burnt down, it's still standing. The whole front edifice is still standing. And that's because when the church builds a church, even 800 years ago, they cared enough about the people coming into the church that they're going to build it safely. So we shouldn't assume that, well, if it wasn't for the civil government, you know, all our churches would be collapsing. It's a good thing the civil government's around to make sure we build them all safe and, and such. No, we already had that in inside of us. Of course, we would want to build a safe uh, church building. So I'm, I'm not saying that so we can ignore building codes. I'm just saying don't think so low of the church that we wouldn't serve Lord's Supper safely, wouldn't do nursery safely, wouldn't build a church safely, and so on. Of course we would. We have the best interest of our own congregation at heart. So anyway, that was a really long rant to the, to the question. Yes, sir. Question. So the penalties are depending which. So um, so conversion therapy. That's um, so the advertising and the making money off of it. I think the penalty is up to two years in jail. But the forced conversion therapy or conversion therapy on a child up to age 18, of course, and uh, taking a child out of the country for conversion therapy. Those three is up to five years in prison. And yes, that would apply to a parent as well. So if you're a parent and you're looking around for help for your, your teenager or your daughter, or your, your younger daughter, whatever, Nadine, think Nadine, right? Your parent, she's six or seven years old, all confused at, at school, no, thank, no thanks to the public education system. So you take Nadine, go down to the States and say, uh, meet a, a world-renowned counselor down there who said, oh, I can counsel her and, and get her comfortable in her own skin again. That would be a crime and, and if this bill passes and she could face, the parents could face up to five years in jail. Probably wouldn't get five years in jail, but that, but that's the maximum. Uh, so it'd probably be be less than that. Um, but again, you don't want to find out on the day of your sentence. You want to know well before then. You know what's actually going to happen. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the sentence. It could be fines as well. I, I suspect that's actually the way they're going to proceed. Would be to try to um, bankrupt. Any church, Christian ministry, whatever, bankrupt them. You know, find, find them and find them and find them until there's no money left. Um, and uh, what was the other thing I was going to say on that? Oh, yes, related to money, is that, of course, if this passes and your church does do so-called conversion therapy, well, that means that your church is a criminal organization, doesn't it? And the CRA does not give charitable status to criminal organizations. So... Um, this should be a, like a number three or number four concern for churches, but you can kiss your charitable status goodbye. Um, your number one concern is the children. Number two concern is the professionals amongst you that are trying to minister to these people. Number three concern is, is religious freedom, but uh, number four concern might be your charitable status. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Thank you, Andre. Really appreciate it. Um, so other than inviting you to our church, which I would love to invite you to our church, um, so Sounds we can good. talk about that, and directing our folks to ARPA website, how should pastors, um, how should we be, what, what would be the number one thing you're saying to pastors? Like, this is a lot of information. I can't include this in my sermon, you know, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. every Sunday. So what, what's number one thing pastors should be doing, or elders? Uh, I should have seen that question coming. <laughs> um, what's the number one thing? I mean, so um, I didn't. I don't think I mentioned it in the in the presentation. Maybe I just assumed that we would all do it. But is prayer um, and praying boldly, particularly on C six. I think we should be praying for for two things. One is that the work of the the devil. I think this is definitely a spiritual battle, and and the work of the devil would be frustrated. Um, and that, and that God would protect vulnerable children. Like There are going to be so many crushed and broken people uh, when this thing goes through or if this thing goes through. And then also just praying that, that God would bless, bless the process of this bill so that it could be halted in some way. From a human perspective, this bill is going to pass. But I've seen, even in my short nine years with ARPA, that the Lord has intervened 
in other bills in the past which looked for sure that they're going to pass and they intervene and they either got delayed until they died or or ended up changing in surprising and, and frankly somewhat miraculous ways. So so being in, in deep in deep prayer about this, urging the Lord, praying, begging the Lord um, to uh, to help, and then um, yeah, just being being in, involved in the process. So so the one the one example that that was just really really encouraging to me. So I come back to these examples a lot. But three years ago, um, a pastor emailed me and said, "Hey, I heard that the Liberal government is going to change the criminal code and remove." Um, criminal law protection for worship services. And I hadn't heard that, so I'm like, oh, well, let me look into it. So I, I looked around, I'm like, oh, yeah, no kidding. That's ex actually what's going on. So there's a section in the criminal code, it's called Section 176, Section 176, and it protects, it's a criminal law protection. It's, this is another good of the civil government. The civil government has a criminal law protection for worship services. Nobody is allowed to walk into your worship service and disturb it. That's a criminal offense. So if you're worshiping and someone's outside the window hollering and screaming to disturb your worship service or comes into your worship service and starts disrupting your service, that's a criminal offense. You can grab that person and forcibly remove them. They're disrupting a service or committing a crime. Wonderful. They were going to delete it from, from, from the criminal code. Anyway, and so, uh, so that bill went to, it was buried in a much, much bigger bill. And so the bill went to the Justice Committee and, and we mobilized uh, a whole bunch of people to, to flood that justice committee with, with emails. Keep that section, keep that section, keep that section. So over the course of just a weekend, about 1,200 emails jumped into those MPs' inboxes. And so I presented to the committee, explained why we got to keep that section, suggested some tweaks and modifications. You know, got to make them feel good. Like, oh yeah, we understand why you want to change it. You know, kind of older language, no problem. Just tweak it here and here, that's all you got to do. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, um, so I go back to the clause by clause a couple days later. So I'm sitting in listening to the, to the meeting. And so they go clause by clause through the whole bill and they come to that clause. And then, so, you know, it's a liberal majority. So they're just, yeah, no, no, no amendment needed, no amendment needed, no amendment needed. And then you come to that clause and you're like, um, and everyone's like, I got tons of emails this weekend. I had an, one person, I had an avalanche of emails on this. I think we've got to rethink this. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they end up saving the sections. They tweaked, tweaked some of the language. We're like, oh, yeah, let's, let's keep it. So they kept it. And so it went back to the house and it passed and it was all good. Even though the justice minister at the time was like, no, we don't need that section. It's irrelevant or it's redundant or whatever. Uh, it ended up uh, being saved. And that kind of just being in tune and, and being engaged and not thinking that, oh, we just got to leave it to, to lawyers and politicians and lobbyists to fix this kind of stuff. It, it's the Christians on the ground and, uh, encouraging their local MPP, their local MP, building relationship with them, getting a mutual uh, mutual trust and respect for each other. Like it, it, take, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually take that much work, but it does take some effort. If, if your church members don't know your MPP's name and you don't know your MP's name, that's, that's a, I think it's a bit of a failure. And, and like just start there, building that kind of relationship and being ready to act when, when there's a call to act. 